I'm happy to see uh, people uh, taking advantage of our last um, conversation event this fall. Those of you who have been with us before, you may know that we had two speaker series this fall from the Martin Springer Institute, one on race, rights, and resilience, and the other one on Holocaust museums in different national contexts. Susan Neyman from Berlin will end our series in the fall, and depending of where we go with the coronavirus, with COVID-19 in the spring, we may return to the Zoom format, or maybe if we are all lucky, we can meet in person again for these kind of conversations. I'm Bjorn Krondorfer. I'm the director of the Martin Springer Institute. As some or many of you may know, it was founded by a Holocaust survivor from Benjamin, Poland, who was a resident of Flagstaff, um, Doris Martin. She's still alive. She now lives in California. And we're happy that they made possible the institute that has educational public programming on both the legacy of the Holocaust and on severe injustices and harms that happen today that need to be addressed. Today's talk will uh, take us to um, Berlin in terms of our speaker, but really take us on a, a journey, maybe a difficult journey to think about evils in a nation's past, and in this case, uh, the United States and Germany, and what we, how we can think about it, if we can learn something from each other about that one. The, um, all of our sessions will be 75 minutes long. They are recorded, so you can look them up later. All eight of our, of our conversations are on record. Um, if you go to the Martin Springer Institute, you, um, you will find um, a link to our YouTube channel where you can look up the eight different conversations. Um, I encourage you to ask questions during the Q&A part of our talk this morning. Um, Susan and I will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes. That leaves us about 25 minutes for your questions, your short comments, and things you would like to know about um, the thoughts and ideas that you're going to hear this morning. If you do so, please unmute yourself and ask the question. If you are, for some reason, too shy to ask the question yourself, you can put it on the chat and Melissa and I will kind of monitor the chat and may pick on some of these questions and read them aloud. So again, and welcome everyone. It's now my pleasure to in introduce to you Susan Neyman. She's the director of the Einstein Forum in um, Berlin, or I should say near Berlin, in Potsdam, near Berlin. Um, she was born in Atlanta, Georgia. She studied philosophy at Harvard uh, and at the Free University of Freie Universität in Berlin. She was a professor at Yale University and Tel Aviv University before she took the position as the director of the Einstein Forum. She wrote a number of books. Two of them I showed you on the screen before we started. Uh, the book that is under discussion for today, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, and an earlier book on Jewish Notes from Berlin. But in between a number of books in English and in German, in both languages um, on different issues that relate to philosophy because Susan Neyman is a trained philosopher. And uh, if that comes up later in your Q&A, um, please do so. Um, and Susan is probably happy to tell you about some of her other philosophical writings. At least one of them also addresses evil very directly in philosophical terms. Welcome, Susan. Um, Thanks, Jen. I just, so that you don't scare people away, I should add that, um, yeah, I am a trained philosopher, but I have spent the last, gosh, um, well, at least 25 years of my life, more than that, 30 years of my life, um, writing about philosophical questions, not for a professional philosophical audience, but for a general public. So people shouldn't be scared away by this. They're not, of course, in Germany, but you know that they are in the States. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. So the book we are talking about today, it's not about philosophizing about Kant or someone else, um, but about, just as you said, Susan, about um, bringing to our attention um, issues that are really uh, 
serious issues that different nations need to come to terms with. Um, I um, would like to, oh, I should probably say to people, Susan, I agreed that we have a conversation rather than just a straightforward presentation so that you know what to expect. Um, my first question, Susan, you, you were born into a Jewish family in, in Georgia. Um, you studied at some of the East Coast universities. You studied and uh, trained in Israel. You studied and trained in Germany. You journeyed yourself um, from, from the South in, in the United States to the Northeast, to Israel, to Germany, um, sometimes back and forth. Eventually, you settled in Berlin. Um, and that indeed seems to make you uh, the perfect fit to write a book uh, in, in how to think about um, past injustices, uh, severe injustices in two different countries and um, how to, to give us some help of how to think about it and what perhaps we can do about this. Um, the title of course might be somewhat provocative for some people, learning from the Germans for an American audience and maybe particular from a, for a Jewish American audience might be evocative at least. And I think there is some intention behind it. So with that introduction, I want you to, to kind of help us understand what your book is about uh, and what, what you would try, what you would like to convey in this book to an audience interested in these issues. Well, thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Um, I have to say that, yes, initially the title was seen as provocative uh, in the US. In fact, I didn't get a grant that everybody swore I was going to get because people thought there was an implicit comparison that was, quote, tendentious. I thought about writing back to the grant giver and saying, you really only went, I looked up all the possible meanings of the word tendentious, which really just means controversial. I said, you really only want very bland books. I didn't do that. Um, fortunately, I got a sabbatical and I had the money to finance my own um, trip to the Deep South, which took the better part of a year. Um, by the time I was done with the book, uh, and it was out, and I did a, a book tour last fall in the US through the whole or much of the country, no one in the States found it provocative at all. That is, after three years of Donald Trump and after Charlottesville, uh, people were perfectly willing to learn from the Germans about race and, and the memory of evil. No one took offense in the least. The funny thing is the people who really don't like the title are the Germans. Germans are very bothered by the title. Um, and uh, although it's got some good reviews in Germany, and I take that as a confirmation of my thesis. That is to be a good German is to immediately say, we did too little, too late. Uh, we don't want to serve as anybody's you know, moral teacher. And uh, it's, it's been quite amusing to compare the, the different reactions. Um, I should say that I, I started, this book sort of had two beginnings. One is when I first came to Berlin as a Fulbright Fellow in the fall of 1982, thinking I was only gonna stay a year, having no, no clue what it was gonna do with my life. And uh, I was working on a dissertation on Kant and I thought, well, I'll learn a little German and learn a little uh, German philosophy and go back. And what struck me immediately in the fall of 1982 was the intensity with which people were preparing for the 50th anniversary of the Nazi power takeover. It should be noticed in this year of somebody's Lord 2020 that um, while the Nazis like to call it a Machtergreifung, a power grabbing, it was actually the result of a democratic election. That can happen. Um, but that's an aside that I'm sure you're all quite aware of. Now, this was not a state-sponsored commemoration at all in West Germany. Uh, on the contrary, this was a product of activists and intellectuals and artists, the sort of people that I would gravitate to normally, um, you know, wherever I went. And immediately in 1982, I started thinking, um, Gosh, why don't 
we do anything like this in America. We stopped talking about Vietnam after the war was over. We've never had a conversation about Hiroshima. Now, that's true to this day. And I wasn't thinking as far back as the Civil War, early American history, but I was enormously impressed by this engagement of civil society to explore the histories of uh, their own neighborhoods, uh, talk about their parents and their teachers and what sort of propaganda and or silence they had received when they were growing up um, to create exhibits and uh, theater and film all through Berlin. And I was just enormously impressed with the concept, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, working off the past for those who don't speak German. That's how I translate it. There are a couple of different concepts, but I think that's the one that works the best and is most accurate. So I, I thought about these questions for a very long time. Berlin in the 80s was a completely different place than it is now. Uh, I knew one other American Jew there. I'm told there were two others, but I didn't meet them at the time. Uh, there were very few Americans if they weren't part of the occupying army. And apart from some small refugee communities, primarily Chilean, where a number of my friends, I found a number of my friends, uh, and a Turkish community that was basically uh, involved in low wage jobs and fairly uh, separate from the rest of the country. There just weren't a lot of foreigners at all, much less Jews or Americans. And uh, in the end, I decided to leave Berlin in 19, at the end of 1988, partly because I had already had my first child and it did not seem like a place where I could raise a Jewish or even a foreign child in a way that would be normal. Uh, so I went back to the States, I taught philosophy at Yale, I then taught philosophy at uh, Tel Aviv University and I was uh, offered this very tempting job to be director of the Einstein Forum in, 20, uh, in the year 2000. And what appealed to me was the, the fact that it was a place where I and other people could do high level intellectual work, um, you know, and meet other people doing that, but I wouldn't be confined to the ivory tower. It would have a much larger reach than that. And that appealed to me a lot. And I had been following, albeit from a distance, the kind of transformations that Germany had gone through, particularly after uh, Germany had its first social democratic green government in 98. That was, uh, that was an important moment. And I decided it was a place where I could raise children. So I, I, I thought about all of this stuff in an extraordinarily personal way around the question, could I live here? Could I bring children here, raise children here? But it wasn't until President Obama's eulogy for the nine churchgoers who were murdered in Charleston that I realized, uh, gosh, America is finally doing its own Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. And I do think that's an important date. I think President Obama was the first national leader, not only, uh, I mean, there wasn't even a serious national leader, much less a president who connected the violence of the present with our repression of the violence of the past. And, uh, you know, you saw people responding. You saw two Republican governors in the South taking down the Confederate flag. You saw Wall Street, uh, sorry, not Wall Street, Walmart, interesting <laughs> slip of the tongue there. Walmart uh, announced it was no longer going to sell Confederate memorabilia. And uh, it seemed very, um, very exciting. So I, I, uh, I did not want to preach from uh, afar. I think that of course cultures can learn from each other, but of, of course they're never identical. We can go into that, those questions later, Bjorn. <clears throat> and so I, I set off for the deep south 
not because I think that racism is only a problem in the Deep South, but I, I like to say that Mississippi is a magnifying glass for the rest of the country. It's just all clearer there. Uh, you see the best and the worst of the country there. And the history is all out in the open, all, often falsified. But there are people there working for racial reconciliation, working to uh, uncover this history, to tell the real histories. And so I spent the better part of a, uh, a year following people around and learning from them and uh, seeing what kind of work was going on there. How's that for an introduction, uh, Bjorn? I, I should also say that, um, you know, it was very important for me, first of all, to write this book in a personal voice as someone who was born as a white girl in the segregated South. My mother was involved in the school desegregation campaign. And so I, I grew up in the middle of the civil rights movement. Um, my, uh, you know, family wasn't as famous as Susanna Heschel's, but that was the atmosphere that I was raised on and with the same kind of self-evidence that this is what we do. Um, so it was important for me to write the book in the first person and, and to say it is a kind of a weird journey uh, white girl segregated South. And as I said, look, I'll, I'm likely to end my life as a Jewish woman in Berlin. Nobody knows where, where they'll actually end, but um, it's been a strange journey. But I also wanted to make sure that other people's voices were present as well. So I did lots of interviews of people in uh, Germany as well as in uh, the Deep South. In fact, I met Björn because he, he appears very briefly in, in the book. I didn't write a longer uh, discussion of that seminar, but he was leading a seminar for, uh, or a workshop, groups of people who were descendants of Nazis and descendants of Jews, and they come together on a fairly regular basis. And I wanted to see how those workshops go, so that's where I met Björn. Um, how's that for a beginning? It is a very good beginning, Susan. <laughs> and you, uh, for those who haven't read the book, um, it is it is it is indeed based on many many conversations that you have with people as you travel. It is based on your observations, uh, and you bring in really also sometimes the landscape and the feeling of a landscape, whether it is whether it's a certain oppressiveness in the air or not, or how people respond to you. Some of whom you interview intentionally, and some of with whom you just have uh, accidental conversations, and then share your analysis and your ethical thinking at the same time. So it's really a mix of, of a wonderful mix of different ways to think about these issues. Your book is divided in three parts. The first one is to uh, uh, really introduce Germany and, and post-war German efforts of coming to terms somehow with the legacy of the Shoah, the Holocaust, the World War II, the second part is called Southern Discomforts, where you travel back to, to the South, to Mississippi and your encounters there. And in the third part, you kind of bring, bring them both together to draw some lessons out of, out of these. I'd like to start the first question with the first part. You're quoting um, Ingo Schultz in there, a German person there, and you quote him approvingly. And he's quoted in the following words. Uh, Ingo must have said to you in some conversation, Try to look at your own country as if it were a foreign one. It is crucial to have a broken relationship to one's past. I think Germans understand that easily if you were born and raised there. Um, mm -hmm. Can you help us translate this either into the American context of how, why that speaks to him and to you as, as a kind of a guiding, the possible guide in, in this journey? Yes, um, it should be said for those who don't know him, Ingo Schultz is an excellent and quite well-known writer uh, in Germany and, and politically active. I mean, he, he's written a slew of good novels, but he's also very active 
um, in different political issues. And it's important to say that he comes from East Germany, which had a very different history from West Germany. We might go into that uh, or not, as you please. But yes, I like that quote very much. And I think it's enormously relevant to uh, the discussions that we're having in America today. I know I say we, but since I spend half of my life on, no, I spend most of my life on Zoom at the moment and the other part following uh, most of these discussions, I, I, I'm, I'm having them as well. Look, um, America's gonna have to do some extremely painful reckoning and we, I think, began doing that with uh, President Obama's eulogy, as I said. It, of course, got much more painful, but also much clearer during the administration of the uh, present person who refuses to leave the White House, uh, whose name we're also sick of that I don't like mentioning it, but I think it's very clear to most people. And uh, President Obama has even said it in his marvelous new book, which I haven't quite finished. I just got it and it's long, but it's brilliant as one would expect if you've read his other books, that uh, Trump's election was a backlash to the fact that a black family lived for eight years in the White House and were models of grace, integrity, and dignity. Uh, even if you don't agree with every single one of Obama's policies, they served, and I, I really do mean all of them too, I think that was extremely important, the way that they functioned as a family. Uh, they served as models for all of us. Um, sometimes it's said it's models for young black children, and I'm sure that that's true, but as models for all of us. And the fact that the United States had not examined its racist past is what blew up, you know, from Mitch McConnell's very first statement that the only thing the Republicans uh, should do is make him a one-term president and the constant obstruction of everything that he tried to do uh, to finally, uh, you know, the election of someone who in every way is the diametrical opposite of President Obama. And I, I think it was a shock to all of us, not because anybody I knew believed that we were entering a post-racial future, but we did think we had gotten somewhere um, with the election of President Obama. And the hatred that was, uh, that that presidency aroused in, um, you know, unfortunately, a rather large section of the American populace um, has made many people conscious that we need a reckoning, uh, that we can't go forward. And of course, Black Lives Matter did us an enormous service this May and June in drawing those connections. One of the things that made me um, most moved and happy about that was, first of all, the majority of people out on the streets were white people, and it was very much a universalist call. You couldn't, can see in the polls afterwards that uh, some 75% of all Americans now say there's uh, uh, a there is systematic racism in the country. And that's uh, not something that most white people were willing to grant uh, a while ago. So we are at this point where I think the country is acknowledging the sins of our past uh, not only the sins of slavery, and what for me was most important is the period of neo-slavery, as it's sometimes been called. I am on a little uh, crusade to get rid of the term Jim Crow, because I think it's a euphemism that buries much more uh, than it uh, reveals. I think the term Jim Crow allows us to think 
okay, the Civil War ended, there were racist uh, caricatures and there were racial prejudices, but not what Brian Stevenson calls racial terror. And I think that's what was buried for so many white people in this country for such a long time. They're just a hundred year old hole in our history. So people, we are beginning to look at that. We are also beginning to look at what really is the original American sin, namely the theft and genocide of uh, indigenous peoples, which is really how we got started. For those of you who don't know it, um, you know, Hitler uses this as, used this as an example. He said, look at the, you know, what the Americans did when they won the West and extinguished Native Americans. Uh, I'm just doing the same thing. My people need Lebensraum. And so if I lay waste to the East in order to colonize it and, you know, kill any, uh, uh, any of its inhabitants that stand in the way. I'm just doing what the Americans did. Might be one of the few true statements <laughs> that Adolf Hitler ever made, but there it is, you know, and that is something that we never faced. Susan, so, one, could, one, could, Susan one could argue um, in order to arrive at these, at, at the necessity to look at America's own past, one doesn't need Germans. You know, you, you can do so without them. So, and in your book, just to, for everyone here, you, you're not saying the Germans did things right. You just say they went on a path that was more productive. Um, so what, why bring in the Germans for Americans to learn something about their own past? Um, it's a good question. I, I just want to say one more sentence. I'm, sure. I'm sorry. Once you ask me a good question, I go tend to go on too much. So good to stop me when um, when you need to. Um, I, about the brokenness, the brokenness is very important because you know when I first came to Berlin in 1982, the people that I was hanging out with, who uh, you know were concerned with confronting the Nazi past, um, they wouldn't read Goethe. They felt that all of German culture was contaminated by the 12 years of the Third Reich. And, you know, that's a mistake that we don't need to make, although I understand it. It's a mistake that some people are making now in the States. That is, once you face the horrors that your country has committed, um, you might think that, you know, it's rotten from top to bottom. I, I actually, I think. One of my children, my son, really does believe that. Um, but I think it's very important that we sift through our past. It's something that Brian Stevenson said to me when I interviewed him. He said, uh, there were white people in the South who stood up against lynching and you don't know their names. And it's important that we remember those names. So when I said broken relationship to our past, I don't mean, you know, destroyed. I just, and I don't think Ingo meant that either. Um, I just think it's, it's a complicated relation. Why do we need Germany? So you're absolutely right. I don't argue that Germany uh, got everything right. In fact, I think they got lots of things wrong. In fact, I think they're still getting things wrong. But um, they did something that was historically important. And when I've talked to activists and talked to people who are working on these questions in the US, um, one of the things that shocks them the most is that for the first four decades, most post-war West Germans thought of themselves as the worst victims of the war. And that tends to shock Americans because, you know, we we don't know that much about the Nazis. We have a kind of symbolic picture of you know, absolute evil. And then I explain, look, in a certain sense, they were victims. And this was one of the things that I realized in, in working on the book. They sounded exactly like the defenders of the lost cause with some reason, they'd say. We lost our territory, our cities were in ruins, we lost 7 million people were killed, and the men who weren't killed were in POW camps or 
uh, <clears throat> wounded or both, and we were hungry and uh, had no homes. And on top of it all, those damn Yankees were trying to tell us that the war was our fault, okay? Now, it was a huge journey. And I, I, I realized, look, um, most of us would like to see our people as heroes. If we can't see them as heroes, uh, we tend to say, okay, they were victims. They would have liked to be heroes, but they were, vic you know, history made them victims. What the Germans did that was new was to make this third move, which was to say, yeah, it's true, we did suffer during the war and after the war in particular, but other people suffered more and that suffering was our fault. And when I tell this to people who are activists working um, often in the Deep South, <coughs> it gives them hope because they say, gosh, if even the Germans, you know, took a lot of time in, you know, moving from this self-pitying uh, victimization story to assuming responsibility, then we could do it too. So that's one thing that we can learn from the Germans. And one thing that we can learn from the Germans is to expect pushback, right? Um, when the New York Times publishes the 1619 Project, of course, if it wasn't the idiot in the oval, as Stephen Colbert calls him, if it wasn't the idiot in the oval, it would be some other Republican saying, no, 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 they're tearing down our history. We need a 1776 uh, project. You know, There will be pushback, and that's okay. That shows that we're making progress. The other thing that I think we can learn from the Germans is that these are efforts that need to be multifaceted. Okay, they involve um, building a different narrative of our history, uh, a narrative that gets taught in schools, but also in popular culture. Popular culture is terribly important. Uh, the films we, we watch, the art we see, um, you know, the songs we sing are very important in this process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. Um, monuments are important, law is important. It's a, it's a multifaceted process and one shot won't do it. It's funny, I say towards the end of the, the prologue to the book, uh, I, I say it's not like an, a, an immunization. I had no idea we would all be thinking about, you know, immunizations. <laughs> but now, now it, it seems to me, well, maybe we should think of it uh, like a flu shot, you know, something that you need to get every year, um, something that is a multi-generational um, attempt. It's not going to be completed in one generation. But they have given us, if not exactly a roadmap, they, they the Germans, have given us uh, some ideas, also some ideas of what not to do, but some ideas of how it can be done. And, and then the final thing is, I mean, I don't really know that much of your own biography, Bjorn, but um, I'm sure that you had the same experience. Uh, Germany in the 80s, was a completely different place than it is now. It was grim, it was repressed, it was, un you could feel the, you know, the sort of unhappiness on the streets, you know? It was a very, uh, it was still quite authoritarian. It didn't, it was not open to, uh, you know, people from other parts of the world. And through this process, it actually became not just a stronger, but a happier place. And that's a vision that I'd like to have uh, for the United States. I, I know it's a big vision um, and I know the odds, uh, you know, they're, it's gonna be hard, but that's what I'd like to see. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes, the 80s was very different, um, but I left 1983 to the United States ah, and never okay. returned. <laughs> but certainly, you know, uh, you came to, the, to Berlin in 1982, and this is only three years after the Holocaust becomes the, the term that Germans begin to use for the first time for what, what we now know as the Shoah. Before, there was no, not even a term other than right. the Nazi term Endlösung, which meant final solution. 
So yeah, lots of things changed since then. I, transitioning to, this, to the second part of your book, I, I uh, want to, uh, if, if you're willing, to talk about the one moment, I think you are driving in a car somewhere in New Jersey and you see yourself singing along a Joan Bass Baez song and you know which, what I'm referring to. Maybe you yeah. want to say something about it. Yeah, it was a real epiphany that, um, that happened. It was about a week after I had turned in the final manuscript to my publisher. And so I didn't put it in the book, but I did put it in an afterward. Um, and I was, it was late at night, it was raining. I was on the New Jersey Turnpike and actually scared that I was gonna fall asleep at the wheels. So I turn up the radio and I start singing aloud. And a song comes on, which is a beautiful song, Joan Baez's The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. She didn't write it, but it's one of her most famous covers. And I start singing and I think, wait a second, um, this is an elegy for the lost cause. And I can't sing this any more than I can sing, you know, or, or could I sing The Night They Drove the Wehrmacht Down? However, you know, beautiful the tune was, I couldn't. And the interesting thing is that, that Joan Baez's civil rights creds are as good as they get. I mean, she famously sang at the March on Washington, but more importantly, she, um, she sang in Selma when white people were getting murdered for joining the civil rights movement in Selma. So um, what that little epiphany did for me was, was to make it clear once again, this is not Southern culture. I mean, the South, as many people have said, lost the war, but won the narrative uh, all over the United States. And it goes very deep. Um, it goes very deep. I, it turns out somebody wrote a book on how many uh, Hollywood films were um, made about the Civil War and, and um, you know, from which perspective. And we know the famous ones, uh, Gone with the Wind and uh, Birth of a Nation, but something like only 10% of all, all the films that were made of the Civil War were made from the Union side. Everything was made from the Confederate. So it's about the, you know, I, I don't even, I don't even want to say that it's sheer racism. I think it was the uh, acceptance of the idea that no, the war was not fought over slavery, which is we know is wrong, but that was claimed for such a long time. But secondly, uh, you know, well, everybody loves a rebel. You know, you're sort of against authority. So, you know, you have 90% uh, of all the Hollywood movies until I don't forget now when, the, what period this book covered. Uh, were giving us the Southern side of the story, which is really quite extraordinary since, you know, I think what we imbibe from popular culture, and I'm an educated person, um, and I still think popular culture has more of an effect than, you know, uh, anything one reads or reads. Pardon? Somebody asked something. No, I think it was just an interference. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it, sometimes people, are, okay, we're trying to mute people uh, when that happens, Melissa and I. Um, that brings me to the second part. And I want to ask you two more questions. There's one and then one more, and then I open it up to everyone else. Um, there are many, many moments I could have picked from part two, Southern discomforts, as you call them, but I want to, um, um, Talk, talk, for you to talk a little bit about Emmett Till. You're in search of Emmett Till. It was such a, a brutal murder of a young boy from Chicago. It really shook the nation at the time. And most people know what, what I'm referring to. And you kind of go back and try to find the places where it happened and some of the conversations you had. Obviously, that in itself could be an hour long talk. But uh, what is your takeaway from your encounters and your search for the legacy of Emmett Till? You know, Pion, it's very hard for me to have a quick takeaway. <clears throat> and that's why that, you know, that chapter is as long as it is and, and a number of, a lot of people have commented on it. I spent some time in the Mississippi Delta as uh, the guest of somebody who runs 
the Emmett Till Interpretive Center, which is an initiative that began when this little 400 person town decided to um, make a public apology to the remaining family of Emmett Till. It is uh, it's the place where the trial was held of his murderers, uh, where after an hour and seven minutes, they were uh, uh, declared not guilty. And a few months later, they sold their story to Look Magazine and said, of course, they were guilty. Um, what's so interesting about that is the way in which that memory is being is carried on from so many people it, there's still actually a controversy about what county uh his body was found in i mean it's 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 very local i i found uh i just i found the mississippi delta absolutely fascinating you either hate it or or you're drawn into it and i was tremendously moved by these groups of people, uh, half of them black, half of them white, working together to try to use this story as uh, a way of moving forward in racial reconciliation. Um, but of course, there are also pe people who aren't. I, uh, I spent a long and difficult day with the son of uh, the lawyer who defended the um, the murderers. I, there's a rumor that he belongs to the Klan. You know, uh, I, he certainly has views that would fit with the Klan. And so you still have people in this town uh, who deny the murder. But what interested me, of course, was, you know, how can you deny, I mean, it happened. It was perhaps the most, well, certainly the most famous lynching of the 20th century. Um, but uh, the web of denial and the ways in which people try to do that, and then the ways in which other people in the community were working very hard to say, we have this historic responsibility to be a place where people come together and they do it's again it's it's small scale but uh although they've recently gotten a grant i think to do much uh you know more work which i'm glad about but it is the kind of community work that one hopes could be done in many many places uh all over the country but again i can't you know, without sort of going into describing each of those people, it's it's really hard to convey, uh, you know, the the spirit of that. But it was was one of the most uh, moving experiences of uh, of all the research that I did was spending some time in a in a little apartment that was lent to me looking over the courthouse and listening to the freight trains go by in the night and uh, meeting some very incredible people. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, again, your book really shows us when you interview people, it shows a spectrum from anti-racist activism to uh, denial on the other side and defensiveness and everything in between, really. And so you get a sense of personal involvement and personal identifications and engagements with the past uh, for good and for bad, but, right. but, but it becomes very personal. Uh, that brings me to actually my last question. Most people would say that shame is such a strong emotion, such a personal emotion, uh, that it, uh, and complicated emotion or reaction, that there's not much positive about it. There's nothing positive about shame, and it's certainly nothing that one wants to bring to public discussion or into public discourse because ultimately it's something deeply personal. Um, but you take a different take. You actually say that shame can be, I'm quoting you, shame can be the first step toward responsibility. Can you help us unpack this a little bit, especially yeah. since you just mentioned a person who seems to be still in denial about even the simple fact like that this was a murder? 
Uh, you know, for John Witten Jr., I, I, I mean, I think you're, you're never going to bring everybody along. You just have to face that some people's lives after a certain point have been so bound up with a set of false beliefs that you're not going to be able to change them. But there's sometimes they're conversion stories. I mean, there really are. So, um, you know, the younger, the better. But um, even older people can be changed. Um, look, uh, you're right. Shame is a really controversial uh, piece of this work. And in fact, when I was in Mississippi, I was based at something called the Institute for Racial Reconciliation, and uh, which holds workshops and does or did quite wonderful work. They've gone through some changes since I was there. Um, and there, one of their mottos was, no shame, no blame. This is not how we work. We, uh, you know, we think shame is a negative emotion. It's not what we want to evoke. And it was Brian Stevenson, actually, who told me that um, he thinks shame is a really important uh, force for change. If you're not ashamed of something, you don't change it. And I, I thought about that for a while in the German context and thought about the, the role uh, of shame, thought about the stories that people told me, people of, you know, our generation, Bjorn, or maybe a little older, uh, you know, what the effect was of traveling in Europe, say, and pretending to be Dutch or Danish so that they wouldn't have to say that they were German. And, you know, realizing that even if their parents saw themselves as victims, the rest of the world saw them as perpetrators. And, you know, my guess is that that did play a role in, in people's, um, you know, starting to do this work of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. And uh, I think Brian is right. I think that until we're actively ashamed of our complicity in racism and racist violence, we are unlikely to really do anything about it. Because why? We all have lives, you know? I mean, we have, most of us have jobs, many of us have children, um, you know, families, of various kinds of commitments. Um, why get involved in a process that is large and uh, multi-generational and um, difficult? unless you genuinely feel, you know, not just a vague sense of responsibility, but sort of shame that your people didn't take up this responsibility before. I mean, maybe they did, and then you're, you know, have the good fortune to carry on a, a family tradition, but um, shame for your country people, you know, maybe. So I was thinking about uh, homelessness, well, about the concept of Heimat and home, homeland, and uh, because the Einstein Forum was running a virtual conference on this last week. And uh, I, as somebody who has lived and worked in three different countries, was you know, trying to think about what that meant to me because it's not obvious if you actually, and as I'm sure you will know, um, if you've lived and worked for a long time somewhere else, it's not obvious uh, where your home is. And then I started realizing uh, I actually feel uh, shame. I feel perhaps, I, I feel concerned if there's a right wing party uh, that gets into the German element, but I feel ashamed that 74 million of my country people uh, voted for a rerun of the show of the last four years. I really feel shame. And that, that's something that I feel you know, more moved, therefore, to try to make some contribution to um, than, uh, than something in a country that I didn't, even if I've lived in, in it for a long time, um, something, it, it's just quite different. So I do think it's, it's a powerful force precisely because it's a disturbing force, shame. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. I, I actually would very much agree with what you just said. Um, having journeyed through that journey of shame myself, which is yeah. very different from 
guilt or personal guilt or guilt feeling yeah. or collective guilt, it gets to your core. And then the question is when you are at this core, because that renders the person very vulnerable, do you get the support to turn this into something productive or do you not get the support and it turns into something very defensive and you go back into your denial? And, and that is always the key moment, um, I think, at least in my experience. Susan, I think it's time for to see what people would like to hear from you and what they want to ask. I briefly glance at the chat, a lot of chat happening. So, but rather than trying to figure out what question to choose from the long chat that I'm seeing, it would be lovely if someone would actually just talk to Susan directly and ask your question directly. Sure. There is Tom first. Hi, good morning. I, I love your book. Uh, it was, it was refreshingly written in, you know, um, layman's language and imagery. And I really appreciated the personal qualities you brought to it. My question has to do with um, the similarities and the differences between the German experience and the American one uh, in, in two ways. One is the timeline, 12 years versus 400 years. Um, and the second is uh, how, in other words, the, the focus on Mississippi, I understand that <clears throat> it was very relevant, but um, you do mention other aspects of the, the racial crimes in America, like redlining, which is much more complex, much more diffuse, um, much less understood by, most people wouldn't even recognize the term redlining. And, and yet it's one of the most pernicious things. So I, I guess I'm just looking for, for you know, how, which things to, uh, which of the German experiences are truly, you know, meaningfully applicable here. Um, really appreciated your statement that language is front and center. Anyway, that's, that's my question. So, as you might remember, I do spend the first chapter going through all the differences that there, that, that are between the two cases. It's not that I think, you know, you can do a sort of one-to-one -one translation from the one culture to the other. 400 years versus 12 years, look, um, you know, genocidal uh, anti-Semitism, well, genocidal anti-Semitism wasn't even um, 12 years long. I mean, they didn't even decide uh, to murder all the Jews until uh, the Banze Conference. So it was actually quite a short period. But um, German anti-Semitism has a long history. I do not at all buy the Goldhagen thesis that it was the most important part of German culture. It wasn't. But um, you know, I, I will tell you that uh, after Albert Einstein had already invented uh, relativity theory, uh, in order for him to be elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences, someone had to write a letter saying, I assure you that Dr. Einstein is free of offensive Jewish qualities, you know? So, I mean, we like to think that there was this great Jewish German symbiosis. It was really short and it was never full, it was never full blown, okay? Um, I mean, you, people weren't, uh, you know, the first Jewish politician of any national stature, uh, Walter Rattenau was assassinated, um, whereupon Einstein got death threats too. I mean, it was just, it's, it's a myth, I think, to say, look, it was only 12 years. It wasn't. That's not to say, as Goldhagen says, you know, that it's the defining feature of German culture, but it was a defining feature of German as of other European cultures. That's just anti-Semitism is an international problem and an international uh, thing. So that's the first thing. Um, for, so, uh, so, I mean, I think you could certainly trace back, I mean, there were pogroms um, going back to the early Middle Ages. So you could certainly say that anti-Semitism in Germany has as long a history as American racism. The other question that I often get is, well, if the Germans have started doing this already, 
um, how come it's taken us so long and do we have any hope um, given that it's taken us and then and and then comes the we're 150 years or more than 150 years and as I argue in the book I do not think that we should count from the end of the Civil War because this hundred year period this age of racial terror that included everything from lynching to convict leasing to redlining to African Americans being excluded from most of the social security provisions that other Americans got and that helped Americans, white Americans, into the middle class in the 30s. Um, and in order to pass the bill, uh, FDR had to exclude, I mean, this was a euphemism, domestic and agricultural workers. Well, how many black people uh, you know, of the time had jobs that were not as domestic uh, and agricultural workers, it was not even 30%. So effectively, um, policies like that prevented uh, even the hardest working African Americans and those who had left the South in the hopes of getting away from lynching um, and terror, uh, it prevented them from entering the middle class. And all of those, uh, all of those things are immensely important. I agree with you entirely, redlining and, you know, the redlining meant that uh, servicemen coming back from World War II, fighting fascism and racism abroad, um, first of all, they, they were, many of them, if they, especially if they went back to the South, uh, they were lynched or faced with um, threat of lynching. But secondly, they couldn't buy homes on the GI Bill, um, you know, which is, again, what helped many, uh, many white returning servicemen to you know, establish just a small basic uh, entry into the middle class. So all of that's exactly true, but because all of that went on so long until it was at least officially uh, made illegal by the Civil Rights Act, of course it went on in practice and it still goes on with segregated neighborhoods, but all of that was uh, officially made illegal by the, by the Civil Rights Act. And that was a hundred years after the end of the Civil War. So it seems to me that if the Germans started in 45 and we're starting, you know, if we start counting not from 1865, but from 1965, we still have a chance. Uh, thank, hello? Thank you, Susan. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry. I would like to, first of all, congratulate you, Björn, that you chose Susan Nyman on the day before the 50th anniversary of Chancellor Willy Brandt going to the museum oh, in the ghetto. The, the, the site the online reminded me this morning of Oh, that. I didn't know that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, what I wanted to ask you, if, if you're now reflecting on it, how much impact do you think Brandt actually had in 1970, rather than even so much, so many years before the 80s? That's a great question, because I think that um, most people outside Germany tend to, um, you know, if, if they have one, uh, vis one image of uh, post-war Germany, they think of Brandt on his knees at the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial, which is why they're then so shocked to hear about how many West Germans thought of themselves as victims, because um, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they have this picture and the picture seems appropriate, even if they know, as they should, they often don't, that Brandt himself had nothing to apologize for. He was a social democrat. He fled Germany for Norway as soon as the Nazis came to power. And, uh, you know, but he felt that as chancellor of the country, he felt responsible for the country and he made that gesture. Frankly, uh, I believe the gesture had more of an impact on people abroad than it did within Germany because I was shocked to learn how many people, how many West Germans thought he shouldn't have done it. Um, it was still the case that more people felt like victims than like perpetrators. 
uh, getting on your knees in front of the Slavs who had been seen as, you know, untermenschen, not entirely human, was seen to be a submissive gesture, what some Republicans would call an apology tour, which uh, they didn't think they could make. And, and even more shocking, um, it sounds to me like you will know this, but so many people do not, uh, Konrad Adenauer, the first uh, chancellor of West Germany, ran against Brandt in 1962, that is just eight years before that moment, um, with the slogan, what was Herr Brandt doing abroad for 12 years? We know what we were doing in Germany. That is, he was able to use the thing that made Brandt for foreigners a good German, finally an example of a, you know, a German who fled and, and, you know, and nevertheless felt the need to make it permanent. The very thing that made Brandt a, a, a good German in, in, in foreign eyes made him a bad German in the majority of the eyes of uh, the rest of the country in 1962. So I don't know, it sounds like you've thought a lot about this too. Um, but my take would be that it had more of an impact abroad than it did among uh, among West Germans. Although, you know, maybe I want to question that a little bit because, um, you know, 1968 was in Germany um, a moment of protest, not at all just about, uh, I mean, people protested the American war in Vietnam, but they, uh, it was also a moment when those protests were very much fueled by people who said, uh, you know, their parents had been Nazis, their teachers had been Nazis, and they were um, insisting on, on some kind of acknowledgement of that. And so, you know, perhaps those two things happening you have these sort of civil activism from below and leadership at the top, although for a very short period of time, um, maybe it had an impact. But honestly, I think that it's not the official reason why he had to resign, <laughs> but I can't believe that he would have had to resign over the, um, you know, what he resigned over in the end, had the German nation really been behind his his gesture of atonement. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was another question um, that someone tried to get in before and wanted to ask a question. Olivia. Hi. Um, I, I was surprised when the caller said they didn't know what redlining was. And so I want to know the role of education in, in trying to deal with these problems, important things. Thank you. Because if, if people aren't educated about the history, then you know, I think that, uh, again, I, I said 2015 was the beginning of American Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung because I think for most white people, there was an awful lot that we didn't know before then. Uh, first of all, it wasn't taught in the schools but it wasn't discussed in the papers. I grew up in the South and I had no idea when those monuments went up. I assumed like, um, you know, many people, oh, those are just monuments that people put up to honor their fathers or sons or whoever fell right after the Civil War. I did not know that they were put up in two distinct waves of white supremacism after some gains from, you know, two waves of the civil rights movement um, so, you know, uh, I mean, I think the role of education is crucial. What I, you know, also want to insist is that 
again, uh, in addition to rewriting our school books and making sure that certain things are taught properly, um, I, um, you know, we need to we need to bring these issues into popular culture. Frankly, I hadn't heard of uh, redlining until I read Tanahesi Coates's piece on reparations, which I think came out in 2014. I just didn't know about it. Uh, and I didn't know, for example, about, you know, most African Americans being excluded from social security until I began to research this book. Now, again, I can, I can feel a certain amount of shame uh, for not having known these things before I began to work on them. Uh, and I, but I suppose I, I, I feel less shame. Um, but uh, let's see, she's saying, just to be clear, I raised the issue of redlining. No, no, I understand, you know, whoever, whoever raised the issue, I do understand this person knew about redlining, but I also, uh, I suspect, and I don't know what your own personal experience of it is, but I suspect that most white people did not know about it until ta uh, Co uh, Coates published that very well-known essay by now. And, uh, you know, I can also remember in the 2016 campaign, um, Hillary Clinton, who is certainly an educated woman, whether or not you uh, voted for her, uh, Hillary Clinton confused Reconstruction and Jim Crow. Now, that is not something that I think could happen now, but it happened four years ago, um, which goes to show that I think you know, the, the suppression of history in popular culture is not an accident. Um, there was a reason why people did not want these pieces of our history to be known. And it's up to us to insist that they are known. Uh, Susan, there were a number of questions um, that were more detailed than what I'm asking, but um, they might, uh, center uh, on the issue of justice versus kind of a repair and moving forward um, for, for these crimes. W where are you standing on this? Say between some collective repair and justice, or you may want to use the word reconciliation, whatever word you're comfortable with. How do, you, how do we balance these needs? And, and one of the question was like one of the killers or some person thinks there's one of the killers of people um, involved um, somehow with the killing of Emmett Till is still alive. So should yeah, they be brought to justice? Carolyn, Carolyn um, I forget her last name. Yeah, uh, she's an old woman and she uh, was a witness and claimed that Emmett Till had grabbed her. Um, and she more or less, I mean, she's not quite dead, but it was more or less a deathbed confession, which everybody knew that she'd lied. Um, she did confess that she's lied. Um, uh, do we, you know, I was, I was very much in favor that the person who uh, orchestrated and planned and organized the murder of uh, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, who were my personal heroes in the civil rights movement, they were lynched. Uh, taking part in the voting rights drive during Freedom Summer in 1964, um, through the work of the Winter Institute that I was based at, they finally brought the killer to justice, uh, which nobody had wanted to do because among other things, he was a preacher and they're, oh, how can you touch a preacher? And he was quite aged, um, but I was perfectly happy uh, that he was, uh, condemned and that he died in an orange jumpsuit in a jail uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah, I suppose I think something should happen to, um, I'm trying to move, Milam and, um, well, it's good to forget the name of the killers and not the name of the killed, but um, uh, do I think something should happen to her? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would I, I would not object to her serving time. 
um, even though she is uh, very elderly and uh, demented to some degree, and apparently it was an abusive marriage. So it's not clear, you know, she, she had some, she did not have an easy life either, but, um, you know, testifying uh, to let off her husband, who was one of the murderers of uh, Emmett Till, is uh, it's still a crime that I think ought, ought to be faced. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of persecuting old crimes. There's, I, I know that it's getting late, and I don't know how much time we have, uh, Bjorn. I think we have five more minutes. Ah, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me just crack open the, um, uh, the reparations question. I wrote a chapter on reparations in which I argued that um, first of all, um, as I've been saying before, slavery did not end uh, 150 some years ago. It evolved, as uh, Brian Stevenson said. So, I mean, it took 100 years for us to even get rid of legal forms of slavery. So the argument that it all happened so long ago doesn't wash. Number one, um, no, and and the other thing that that means is that uh, white people who say my ancestors didn't own any slaves are making it way too easy on ourselves because um, very few white people's ancestors owned slaves. Most of us, uh, most of our ancestors, came to the country um, after the end of the Civil War in the great waves of migration. So actually African-Americans have been uh, in the country much longer than most white Americans, okay? So, but, but if you can show that so many features of slavery continued up through the 60s, then that argument that we don't have any responsibility um, goes to hell. And the second piece of the argument is if you understand how much of America's wealth was built on slavery. And it's not just people who own cotton plantations. Um, a book that I recommend is called The Half Has Never Been Told by historian Edward Baptist, uh, who tells the story of co the cotton industry. First of all, some quite horrendous descriptions of what it actually meant to pick cotton rather than the sort of happy Im images of, you know, um, you know, whatever, people singing songs in the fields. Um, and he describes that, but he also describes how much of the Northern economy depended on the cotton industry. And people say cotton in the uh, 19th century was like oil is today. It was, you know, the, most important commodity and all kinds of northern uh, wealth was built on it as well. So if you put all those things together, then I think there's a moral responsibility for reparations. Then there's a practical question, okay? What I said in the book was, um, you know, I, I compared it to the German situation. Uh, and so there have been several proposals about reparations. Um, some of them involve cash. Some of them involve giving priority to the African-American community uh, a, with a whole set of things that in the U United States are called benefits and in Europe are considered to be rights, <laughs> like health care and um, sick leave and parental leave and paid vacation, by the way and education. Um, your frame of reference changes entirely when you stop thinking of those as benefits that are granted by perhaps a generous employer, if you have one, 
um, and you think of them as social rights, which is how people think of them in Europe, not just Scandinavia, by the way. That was a mistake that the Bernie Sanders campaign made was to keep pointing to Scandinavia, which is, you know, which are small, homogenous, somewhat homogenous countries. Uh, Germany is the four, world's fourth economic power. Is there enough money to do it in the United States? Sure, anytime, um, if we had the political will. And um, so, but, so I am entirely in favor of every American receiving the kind of social rights that I enjoy in Germany uh, as a matter of course. And if there had to be prioritizing, I would prioritize the African American community for all of the reasons that, uh, that I mentioned. I think it's owed them. But I've been trying to think about politics lately, and as appalled and ashamed as I am that 74 million of uh, my fellow citizens voted for, I mean, you know, how can we describe him? If he were only a racist, okay. If he were only incompetent, if he were only a liar, if he were only uh, a grifter, if he were, you know, a man who combines the worst features of humankind in one person. And 74 million people still support him. And, and what's even scarier, there are only 26 Republicans in all of Congress who are as of yet prepared to acknowledge that he lost. So we are going to have a really serious um, fight on our hands in the next four years um, because they're not going away. Uh, I would be perfectly happy if he would go away, but 74 million people are not going to go away. And one of the things I've been thinking about is the function of rage in America and in American politics. And it seems to me that although most Americans don't know that the conditions under which they are living are barbaric and could be completely different if they lived elsewhere, the absence of those conditions create a set, a state of constant rage. I notice it when I come back to the States, even under normal conditions, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, here's just one example. Uh, Europeans know because they followed the debates about Obamacare, though they didn't really understand them. They kind of kept being asked, you know, are they crazy? I think he's trying to give them health care and they're saying no. Um, so, so they knew that we don't have universal health care. But during the pandemic, when I began to tell people that we don't have universal sick leave and that in fact the essential workers who are you know, making sure that those of us who have the privilege of working at home get our groceries and our packages, that those people are usually the last to have any sick leave and their wages are so low that they have to go to, to work uh, sick or not, or they will lose their homes. And people looking at me, I mean, honestly, if I had said we chop up little babies for dinner, I don't think they would have been more shocked. You know, um, and what we as Americans find too bad, they find positively barbaric. And, you know, if we don't do something about those basic conditions for the entire population, uh, I don't see a lot of hope in you know, bridging this chasm that has divided us. Um. Thank you, Susan. You, you're ending on the true but somber note. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a lot about, I think the idea about rage in American politics is something we need to pay much more attention to and the underlying cause. And so much is about economic injustice on top of the racial injustice that we focused on today. And, uh, and it will take us a long time to, to figure this out. But I, I do think we need to figure something out because we got 
close to dismantling our own democratic foundations and that should not have happened and shouldn't happen in the future. Susan, me, thank you, you so much. Go ahead. Let me, let me give you uh, one note of hope, by the way, that I want to end on. I want to thank you for running this series. And I, I want to say that it has given me quite a lot of hope. Um, so I have been asked to do a lot of such talks, uh, usually in universities, but the second most, uh, maybe even the first, um, most, um, you know, kind of organization that invites me are Holocaust museums. Holocaust Research Centers, and I find that quite wonderful. That's in the wake of Black Lives Matter. I find it quite wonderful that, um, I know you're not Jewish, Bjorn, but you know, normally these centers are run by Jews, uh, that Jews are rediscovering the universalist trend in Jewish thought that has gone, uh, it hasn't gone entirely missing, but it hasn't been the dominant tradition. It is uh, the prophetic tradition. It, there's certainly lots of lines in the Bible. It's a tradition that I grew up in, in Atlanta. Um, uh, Abraham Heschel was, was by far not the only Jew who was involved in the civil rights movement, 30% of all the white people who went down south and risked, you know, took risks to, to be activists. 30% of them were Jews, and we're sure as hell not 30% of the uh, population. So I'm glad to see that uh, solidarity coming together in Georgia right now in the Senate race. And I'm I'm glad that you're um, you know, that you organized this series of conversations. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see this universalist spirit coming together. Thank you, Susan. Very gracious of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please stay in touch with us. We may add another series in the spring um, of a similar type um, for perspectives on a particular issue that we find important to bring to our discussion attention and to alert ourselves and support ourselves.